Hey, Dave. Yo, J-Money, J-Town, Jagbert. Haha, <laughs> what's with the nicknames? Okay, full disclosure, with the shit going on with your name, I don't wanna, I don't wanna get it wrong. So I'm using nicknames. So to avoid getting my name wrong, you're calling me the wrong name? No, <sighs> fuck. Relax, Dave. Just ask my name like a normal person. Okay, what's your name? Oh, well, I don't know yet. Come on. Look, that doesn't matter right now. How are you since, uh, that stuff earlier? What stuff? You mean getting badass time abilities? No, I mean, um, with your friend. My new friend Dave Sprite, who's also me? I basically get along with him by default, J Cash. Dave. Okay, fine. I'll stop being depressingly cagey. You're talking about... Chad. Yeah. Still super fucked up about him, but... coping. Yeah? You're not just saying that to make me feel better? No. I'm not okay, but I'm not... not okay. Okay? Okay. I got so excited when you said your sprite brought back your Nana to life. I was gonna use my sprite to bring Chad back, but I already prototyped twice. Plus, I don't know if there's anything, uh... left. Yeesh. And then I tried to use time travel to save him, but Dave's sprite said, uh... Preventing his death would cause a time paradox. Oh, wow. So there's... no way to save him. No. But weirdly, that feels okay. That I can't do anything about it. If there was, I would be even more messed up, I think. It's like ten times as sad that he's gone and I can't do anything, but it's also one hundred times less existentially horrible than if I could have done something. Is that fucked up? No. If I could time travel, I'd try my best to save him, so I know what you mean. I'd probably even try if it would fuck things up if it was one of you. <sighs> You're too good. Just don't worry about me, okay? And, uh... Shit, this is awkward. But, uh... No matter what sort of person you want to be, guy or girl or whatever, we're, um, we're still buds, right? Sure, Dave. Tight. I love you. Wait, shit, that's not what I meant. No homo times 100. Also no straight either times 100 if, if you're a girl. Fuck. Dave, Jesus Christ. Relax. I love you too. You can tell your friends you love them, dumb shit. Okay. Anyway, bye, Dave. I'm gonna hang out with my salamanders. Your what? Your name is Dave Strider, but you're not the only one. We've got to decide what to call you, my man. You say, leaning back in your chair, regarding your winged orange doppelganger. Yeah, two Daves could get confusing. Shit's gonna be even more confusing with other time loop Daves running around. Bird Dave floats in midair, hands behind his head. You sure you don't want these? They look pretty badass, you say, indicating to the turntables he'd given you as a gift. Nah, he waves his hand. I'm done with time travel. You get how it works, right? You recall Bird Dave's explanation on time travel, something you hadn't really had time to process yet but when he sees the confusion on your face, he shrugs. What about David, you offer? You both scoff. Nah, son, that shit stinks. I think I'll just be Dave Sprite. Fair enough, you say. Sorry about your, like, uh, timeline, by the way. Everyone else there is just dead? Dave Sprite shakes his head. No, it's more like they never existed, or their existence just doesn't matter, or something. They're reincorporated into the timeline. You have a feeling Dave Sprite is talking out his ass, but you aren't going to call him on it. So now you're a Sprite. Are you going to get weird and cryptic about the game, you ask? Nah, he admits. I do have a bunch of new info about the game, but I'm not going to hold out on you, who is basically me. We're going to optimize this bitch. We're talking speedrun any percent. You grin. You think you're gonna lack hanging out with yourself. Now that we're both here, do we kiss? You say. Dave Sprite laughs. <laughs> nah, dude. Maybe if one of us was a hot girl version of ourselves, he says, rubbing his chin. Not that you're not hot as hell. Yeah, of course, you say, smiling at your bird self. The two of you stare at each other for a moment. No, no homo, you say hurriedly in unison.
Yeah, it's like, we, we like girls, you know? No, no way we're gay, you hastily finish. Totally, just girls, Dave Spratt says, then more quietly, only <sighs> girls. You and Dave Spratt share a nervous chuckle, suddenly unable to look each other in the eyes. Anyway, <clears throat> you say, clearing your throat. Let's get to work. Cool, Dave Spratt agrees. I know some cool tricks to build Rose's place up so she can enter the gate, now that I'm plugged into the game rules. Yeah, you say. He doesn't take his eyes off the screen, focusing on Rose's house. How do we have internet right now, anyway? This place we're in, the Incipisphere. It has a local network that pervades the entire place, as well as an archive of the internet before the destruction of a planet that anyone playing the game can interact with, he states simply. How? You ask, a little dumbfounded. He looks at you with a plain expression and says two syllables, which instantly clear things up. Magic, DS says, shrugging. You have a strong feeling it doesn't matter, and looking further into it would just cause you unsatisfying misery. Done says Dave Sprite. Damn, dude, you work fat. The compliment to Dave Sprite dies on your lips. What do you think, big man? He says, grinning. The tools of Spurb allow for the creation of walls, floors, ladders, stairs, and various other things found in the structure of homes, but DS has bypassed this. Instead of a reasonable staircase or a series of rooms connected to ladders, he's created a single 100-meter-high pole against which rests a massive white ladder. It's, uh, you squint. This sucks, man. What? Dave Sprite looks offended. He looks back, considering for a moment. Then he relents. Huh, <laughs> God, yeah. You look down at your phone, sucking air through your teeth. Rose is gonna be pissed about this. The idea of that makes you amused. On DS's screen, you see Rose looking with a disdain at your doppelganger's ladder tower. She's gonna kick my non-existent ass for this one, he says, wincing. Rose is furiously typing at you into pester chum, but you both wisely decide not to respond. Do you seriously not have an ass, bro? You lean over to DS, unable to keep yourself from looking. Nah, man, he says, shrugging. I'm a brainless feathery Ken doll now. You both decide the ladder pole is good enough. The ladder is attached to the ground and isn't going anywhere due to whatever magic is keeping the suburb constructed objects stationary. I'm gonna need another computer, Dave Sprite says. He's right. He can't just jack in your swag, after all. After a quick trip to the alchemeter, you combine a Paradox clone of your own phone with one of your weird bugs trapped in amber. It creates a horrid phone in the shape of an insect, like an orange organic handheld computer. This is pretty sick, Dave Sprite admits, admiring his new bug phone. And it's color-coordinated. You both high-five. From the roof, you can already see Jade working to build up your own house, walls appearing around you. Soon, it's not your roof at all, your apartment building growing higher and higher. While you wait, you also take a moment to get Dave Sprite a weapon, combining your half-sword as well as a Paradox clone of turntables, giving him a badass sword with a blade that looks like a broken record's edge. Wait, shit, you say, realizing in the process your own sword was consumed. For yourself, you make a Paradox clone of your old shitty broken katana as well as a pair of your bro's spare triangle shades. Your new sword is now jet black and ready to roll. You watch Rose climbing her shitty ladder, giving up on pestering either of you. You'll deal with those consequences later. We'd better get going, Dave Sprite says, walking out to the balcony. He looks upward to where Jade is building your apartment, shaking his head. She's got a real eye for architecture. Too bad we won't need it. We won't, you say. No, dipshit, Dave Sprite scoffs. I'm gonna fly us up there. Dave Sprite opens his arms. Hop in. Awkwardly, you climb into your own arms, leaning against Dave Sprite, his torso remarkably strong and firm against your hands. He's so powerful compared to you now, something that should make you jealous, but doesn't. He's you. You're him. You're here to help each other. Taking a deep breath, you and Dave Sprite nod to one another. He grips you under his arms, and you both fly to your first gate. Your name is John Egbert, you think. You're not sure yet. You never disliked being a boy, really. But you've never liked it in particular, either. 
When you were younger, you remember getting a manga from the school library. Some old run of a Pokemon story. One that had ads for other manga. The publisher also put out. You remember sitting on the floor of your room, sitting on your stomach, rereading one of the ads over and over. An ad for the manga, Ranma One Half. You don't remember the ad's exact words, but you remember being enthralled by the concept. A boy, when splashed with cold water, turns into a girl. Something awoke inside you that made your heart race, and every night before bed you'd reread the ad trying to make yourself dream about being a girl. You know, regular guy stuff. When you finally got your hands on the stories, you loved them. You'd mutter stories about yourself in Ranma's universe to yourself each night before sleep, all written in a tiny composition notebook by your bed. Every time you visited the bookstore, you'd beg your father to buy you a new volume of Ranma One Half. You wonder if the crate of your old manga is still under your bed. If you make it back to your house, you'll make sure to check. But you're realizing that, unlike you now assumed, that was not a normal 13-year-old boy experience. That it might have awoken something more in you than just an interest in Japanese graphic literature. Nana? You say slowly. You're currently sitting on a bed in the upstairs room of an inn in Salamander Town, in the land of wind and shade. She's on a bed adjacent to yours, even though she doesn't have to sleep now that she's a sprite. Yes, dear, she says curiously. She might be your help character now, but she's also your grandmother, someone you feel you can treat as a confidant. You died when I was 13, you say slowly. Nana kindly smiles. That I did, dear. I apologize, but that's just the way of the world, I'm afraid. I hope you remembered me fondly. I did, you nod, smiling to yourself. And I'm really glad you're back, because I always admired you. Well, I should hope so, Nana laughs. Not to toot my own horn, Pumpkin, but between your pops and me, you got a good raisin. You got my smarts and his strength. Heh, <laughs> you nod, gripping the blankets. That's not what I mean. Oh? Your Nana cocks her head to the side, letting you speak. You look out the window. The town of the Salamanders is bustling, even though it's ostensibly nighttime. The distant light of Skya faded below the skyline. The yellow skinned bipedal amphibians trade glowing mushrooms for various goods with each other, blowing bubbles from their frothing mouths. To you, they look so cute. The inn you're sleeping in is quaint, manned by a tall salamander, or at least taller than his contemporaries at a noble four feet tall, a squeaky-voiced old man salamander who demanded five glowing mushrooms to stay at his inn. It feels nice, but it's not home. You clutch the covers tighter. Nana, I always loved looking at the scrapbook pictures of you. You were really beautiful when you were younger. Words spill from your mouth and you can feel yourself shaking. Pictures of you and your brother, Jacob. Pictures of you opening up your joke shop, teaching Dad how to cook. Pictures of you and Grandpa's wedding. Nana is quiet, watching intently. I always wanted to be that beautiful myself. Your throat clenches, but you force yourself to speak. I always wanted to look like... like you. John. Nana's voice is soft. You can tell you've either caught her off guard or she's carefully choosing her words. I'm a, a woman. Wouldn't you rather have looked like your great-uncle Jacob or like Grandpa Sassaker? You shake your head. I wanted to look like you, you say, unable to meet her gaze. Your grandmother sits on the bed next to you, the weight making the whole thing sink, gravity making you lean on her shoulder, her hand gently on your back. I want to be a woman, you say. That thought has been in the shadow of your mind for decades, and as you speak it, it's like the floodgates have opened. Every time you push down that single wish comes pouring into your conscious mind, and every beautiful woman you'd so painfully wished you could be flashes in your skull. Tears sting your eyes. Oh dear, she says quietly. You feel... Shame well inside you. It's not the horrid shame of guilt, though, not the shame that has made you push down your true feelings for two decades of life, but a new shame. The shame that you know that you're something horrible. After all, you're not a woman. 
You're a gangly, broad-shouldered creep with a mustache. You're flat as a board. You're a hideous, masculine body. I'm sorry, you say through silent tears, squeezing your eyes shut, taking off your glasses. This is... I just... I can't... Sweetheart, Nana says, voice stern. I won't uh, pretend to understand what you're going through, but... How to say this? Your heart sinks. You knew this was coming, and you nod, willing to face the facts, willing to accept your Nana, telling you it can never be. But to your shock, she says something you never expected. I, uh, I know you want to be a woman, dear. Nana speaks, and you look up at her suddenly. Her expression isn't pitying, it's not disgusted, it's uh, amused. You, huh? You blink, tears falling from your eyes, no longer welling behind them. Okay, now now you're confused. I mean, John, dear, Nana puts her hand on your shoulders. No offense, Pumpkin, but you took any excuse to root through my closet when your dad brought you over, and you'd insist on wearing heels, and oh, you were the mother in hairspray that one year in your school play, and... Nana continues, but you stop her, cheeks heating up. But you knew? Your jaw hangs open. Oh, of course. And since we started this quest, people have been calling you June. You haven't even corrected half of them. But, you stammer. So, of course you want to be a woman, John, or should I call you June, too? Nana uses a blue hanky to wipe your eyes. Y you don't think I'm a creepy weirdo? You croak, looking down at your hands. I mean, I look nothing like a woman. I've, I've got a man's body. I... A creepy weirdo? June! Nana frowns. Don't go talking about my grandchild like that now. Gasp a laugh, stifling a sniffle, nodding hastily. Sorry, sorry. You swallow thickly, taking a shuddery breath. Look, if you really want to be a girl, June, no one can stop... I certainly don't give a hoot. And frankly, I can't begrudge you for wanting to join the fairer sex. Hoo-hoo! <laughs> she winks at you. We have more fun. You'll see, dearie. We. Your Nana said... We. She hops back into her own bed, and you lay down in yours, feeling... You're not sure. You still feel wrong, like you're trapped in your own body, like something in your very soul is off-kilter, but, but though you still feel that, you also feel far better than you had expected. You feel like for the first time in your life, that your horrible body isn't a prison, but something that's in your hands to change. You'd envisioned yourself falling asleep as an outcast or a deviant tonight after admitting something you hadn't even admitted to yourself, but instead you're falling asleep a loved person. You thought you'd be falling asleep John Egbert, but instead you're falling asleep June. The bustling noise of salamanders blowing bubbles outside lulls you to sleep. You wake up as June Egbert. You're not entirely sure where the hell you are or what the hell is going on. You're not entirely sure you've ever been awake before this moment. You look down at yourself. You're wearing golden robes, laying on the floor next to a golden bed inside of a golden room. It's all very surreal. You have to sit up and check the rest of your body because your boobs are in the way. Wait, what? Something is wrong about that, but you can't place your finger on it. You rub your head, frowning. Why do you have a headache? Feels like someone beat you with something hard. H hello You call out. The bright golden room you're in is rather harsh on your eyes, but after some adjustment you manage to see clearly, locating your glasses on a bedside table. You stand up, trying to remember... anything. All you know is your own name, a vague recollection pulled from somewhere in your memories of which you seem to have none. None except faint dreams which you can barely grasp. Your most recent one was about... an old woman? You exit the room. Hello? You repeat into the hallway outside. Seems like no one is there. Odd. The room you woke up in and the hallway look almost too pristine, not lived in like no one has visited in ages. You step out into the hallway, stretching tiredly, and to your right, you hear footsteps. Someone is coming up the staircase. Hey! You cry out. I'm June Egbert. Can you tell me where I am, please? You watch as a burly man in a suit appears from around the staircase corner. John! 
the man says, his eyes going wide as he sees you. Behind him is a sweet-looking woman holding a wine bottle half full. Oh, no, I, I'm June. Sorry, you say. The man blinks, adjusting his hat. Sorry, miss, he says. You look like my son. He sounds disappointed, and something about him rings familiar in the back of your head. You stare at him dumbly. He looks so familiar, like you've met him countless times before. But that's silly. You've been locked in a gold tower all your life. You're snapped out of your musing by the commotion below. Your reason that whatever it is is causing a fuss, these two are concerned about. Something makes the ground rumble beneath you, and a glance at the glassless window indicates that you're up many stories, fighting going on far below, mostly centered around a strange winged man clad in black. Ah, uh, you point, about to ask, when the dad grabs your wrist. Wait, you shouldn't profile him like that. He might just be an older man. Not all older guys are dads. Is this person his girlfriend? Wife? Something about that warms your heart. Come on, says the man, pulling you down the stairs. Hey, uh, you stop in front of another window, pointing out of it. Why don't we just fly out? The man and woman look at each other. You can, the man asks, squinting. Can't you? You quirk a brow. Can you get us there? The dad man points upwards towards the luminous blue ball high above, the planet around which Prospect orbits, Skya. You're not sure how you know that name, but you nod. I think so. We're pretty close right now. You link arms with both of these... Who are they, anyway? Refugees? You float skyward, or more accurately, skyward, looking down at the kerfuffle below. They're tiny dots by now, but you see an army of white-shelled Prospidians fighting a singular figure, a strange man, a sort of mix between a harlequin, a bird, and some fashion of tentacle monster. Do you know him? You ask. Unfortunately, says the woman. Below, another two figures join the fray, a strange tan figure, and your heart jumps in your chest. That's my sister, you proclaim before you even realize it. You look at your two charges, distressed. You're about halfway between Skya and Prospet now, the moon of the planet, and the surface of Skya visible from about 100 meters up. I'm sorry, you say hastily to the dad man. He shakes his head. If that's your sister, ma'am, then you ought to help her. Nothing for it. Take us back down. This guy strikes you as a fine man, but you don't have time to contemplate that right now. Considering your options, you choose something foolish. See that bush down there? You ask, nodding towards a patch of greenery down below. Yes, the man stammers. Miss, I'd rather you didn't toss us, really. It's okay, we can come back down with you, it's... The beheaded man sees your plan forming before you execute it. With a heave, you toss the duo down towards the planet, the man howling, the woman whooping like you just boarded a roller coaster. You watch to see them land safely, then fly back down to Prospect. Below is absolute bedlam, alarmingly so. Blood spatters the gold streets, a stark red against the robust gold. You land on a nearby roof, watching. The black-shelled man is howling in agony, faced down now by only your sister and an old mustachioed man in a pith helmet and tan adventurer's garb. You don't know what the fuck is going on, but you don't like it one bit, least of all the look of the black-shelled demon in the middle of it all. Homestuck Alternate Universe is written, produced, and read by Funk McLovin. Additional voices include articulately composed as Mom and Rose Lalonde, Janaya Riley as Jade, Captain Lazar as Jack Noir, and A.E. as Terezi Pyrope. Art is by Sunny D, and additional edits are by Funk McLovin. Please support Homestuck Alternate Universe by subscribing, liking the video, and leaving a comment. Homestuck AU is also on Patreon at patreon.com slash funkmclovin. More links in the description.